June 8, 1983, Joe Todd, an interview with William Clare Gans. Mr. Gans, where were you born? Hobart. Hobart, Oklahoma. And when's your birthday? December the 29th, 1905. Who was your father? What? Who was your father? W. W. Gans. William Walter. Mm -hmm. And where was he from? Kentucky. Kentucky. And who was your mother? Who was your mother? Who was your Ella mother? E. Huck, uh, Ella E. Hall. And she was from Wisconsin? Yes. You say your your folks made the run uh -huh. of '93. Yeah, my mother and her father they filed their claim and or drew their claim in El Reno, and they happened to draw a claim that was about a mile and a quarter apart. She drew 160 acres, and he did. Oh, so your father made the run, then your mother was in the lottery. No, that's her no, father. No, her father. Her father. My father didn't get there in time for the run. Okay. So this is the lottery of 1901 in El Reno? Yeah. Okay. What was your grandfather's name on your mother's side? Uh, James... What the heck was his other name? James... A Hall. And now, did you say your father made the run of '93? No, he came there after the run. Yeah. And he met my mother on her lead on her allotted land. She had built her home and was her she and her sister were living on it at the time he came to Oklahoma. How come your father came to Oklahoma? The land of opportunity, I guess, he thought it was. <laughs> his father, his father, made the gold rush in forty nine to California. Hmm. Did he ever talk about the gold rush days or did you know him? Well, he died when I was six years old and all I have is memories of him and my mother told me these other things. Yeah. Did she ever talk about stories of the gold rush days that he talked no, about? No, she didn't know anything about it really. She just knew that he'd made the gold rush. Mm -hmm. What was his name? Uh, I don't know. Really, I, I have it at home someplace. I know in the family history it gives his, his name. Yeah. But uh, I, I couldn't tell you. I know that he was a circuit riding preacher. I do know that. Yeah. Um, what kind of work did your father do? He was a cattle a stockman. Stockman. Stock, horses and mules mostly. Mm -hmm. And he was a personal friend of the Miller brothers. Uh -huh. He did the business with them after he came to Oklahoma. They came from Kentucky, the same same t part of Kentucky. How about the Indian? I'll tell about that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> they, my mother, uh, was on her her. On her claim, and she and her sister was living on it to prove it up. You have to live on a certain length of time. And one night, this fellow knocked on the door and wanted to know about the land. And she said, "Mother told him, said uh, it's mine. I filed a claim on it. My sister and I are living here to prove it up." He said, "Well, I'm glad I found out." And he was with his buddy, and they'd camped down the road a ways. He went back to his camp, and he's told Bill McGuire, who was his buddy, said, there's two good-looking girls up there that filed on that claim, said, I'm going to marry that owner. <laughs> and this Bill McGuire said, well, I'll marry your sister then. <laughs> now, this is a true story. And they did. They did. They did. <laughs> the two of them married the two girls. What year did they get married? Well, I don't, I was born in 1905, and I had a brother older than I was, 19 months, so they were uh, someplace around 
1902, maybe, something like that. Mm -hmm. 1903, they were married. And uh, how far from Hobart was the claim? The claim was a mile east, two miles north, that's how I remembered. And then, so your father started raising stock? Well, he, he was, uh, he, he came into Hobart with some fine blooded mm -hmm. stock. At the time he came in there, he brought some with him. From Kentucky? Yeah. How many and head did he bring with him? I don't remember. I know one horse that he brought with him was a, a, a direct a son of Dan Patch, which was one of the great uh, horses of the time. At, uh, Harness horse, harness racer, and then uh, he had another uh, horse with him that was named Bess. This was George and Bess, and they, my mother and father rode those horses. She rode side side a long time on this Bess. Hmm. Did he ever talk about driving these cattle from Kentucky to? Well, not he didn't fool with cattle much. It was horses, just strictly mules. horses. He bought horses and mules for the government. And he, he made several trips up and traded horses and bought horses and mules from the Miller brothers up uh, in, around uh, Ponca City. Ponca City. Yeah. And uh, in fact, my mother and father were married on a trip up there when they, when they went to Perry and were married in Perry, Oklahoma. Did you ever make a trip with him? To no, the no, that was before my time. That was too small. Mm -hmm. they, uh, this all happened about the time of the World's Fair in St. Louis. And my brother was a baby, and they took, before I was born, they went to the World's Fair in St. Louis. Mm. It's part of the stories that I've heard. Yeah. And uh, my father was a very close friend of Chief Lone Wolf of the Kiowa Indians. And he did a lot of buying and selling and trading with, with Lone Wolf. What did your father say about Lone Wolf? Well, I can't remember too much about it. I know this. that that he'd, he's had meals at my home. I've eaten at the same table with him. He's a very fine gentleman, he really was. And uh, he called my father a heap big tub of guts <laughs> because he was so fat. Yeah. He weighed 350 pounds, my father did. Big man. Yeah, very and I, I heard this story. Now, I don't know how true, I can't remember exactly, but Lone Wolf had a, a robe made of human scalps. Most of them were Indians. It could have been a few white scalps in it, but most of them were Indians. And as I, I think I saw it one time, I was only four or five years old, and I think I saw it one time. I wouldn't swear to it, but that was the story that hmm. my folks told me. What did Lone Wolf look like? Well, you know, that has to go. <laughs> he was, he looked Indian. I mean, he, he was truly Indian. He was large. And as I remember, he wore long hair and braids. Mm -hmm. And outside of that, I can't tell you much about him. He, he dressed uh, in, in our clothes, you know. Mm -hmm. he, he was Americanized enough. He wore our clothes all the time. You ever go to his village? His I've house? been on his uh, farm and hunted pecans and fished on his place mm -hmm. when I was uh, older. Where was his place? It was a mile south and two miles west of Hobart on Little Elk Creek. Mm -hmm. Can you remember what Hobart looked like when you were oh, a child? Oh, exactly. <laughs> Describe Hobart as a child. Well, it was a thriving little country town at the time. I graduated from high school in 1924, and it didn't change much from the time I can remember. It grew a little and, you know, expanded some. But I remember the, the town square especially it was paved. Mm -hmm. The square was paved and it was paved one block each way off on all sides of the square. Was the courthouse in the square? The courthouse and the jail was in the, in the corner and a bandstand over here. Mm -hmm. And I remember this distinctly. Uh, my father with his team of horses, George and Bess, and we'd go downtown on Saturday night to hear the the band play, the band concert. And I was the baby and mother and my brother sat in the back seat of this surrey with the fringe on top. Mm -hmm. And uh, I sat on my father's stomach or lap, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and 
those horses, he'd drive them around the square, and they'd keep playing with that music. Just as perfect as any drum beat you ever heard in your life, those horses could keep time with that music. Hmm. What were the main stores in Holbert at that time? Well, I can't tell you exactly when these came in, but the Dixie store was a clothing store owned by, I uh, can't remember his name at all. It was a Jew. And then the Carruthers store, the post office was a half block off the square. Who was the postmaster? I can't tell you at that time. It's not me, I just don't remember. And the post office was in, uh, in a store building. And I think it was a drug store or something, mm -hmm. anyway, a bookstore or something, and the grocery, and the post office in the back end of it. They later built a, a nice big post office about north of the square, or right on the corner of the square, uh, across from the city hall. Yeah. When did you see your first car in Hobart? When the yeah. first car? Well, I don't remember the first car I saw. I know that. Uh, my father drove one of those, uh, my stepfather, now, was after my father died, had one of those old Buicks that had the running boards on the side. Mm -hmm. It was the first one that I, that's the first car I remember. I was. He had two or three other cars. I remember the first Ford he ever bought, it cost $265. What year was that? Oh, 1913, 14, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. What's your fondest memory of Hobart as a child? Huh. Living there. Living there. Yeah. Now, did you live in town or did you yeah. live on the farm? Well, I lived in town continually until, well, my father bought a farm south of Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. And that was two miles north of Rainy Mountain Mission. That was an Indian mission in there. And he was, his farm was on this old Ozark Trail. You, you know anything about the Ozark Trail? Not really. It, it was uh, established way back there. It was a, a through road from, from the west line, from the uh, western border from Kent, Texas, through to Oklahoma City in a roundabout way. It went by our farm, then off up to, to uh, Anadarko and Chickasha, and then yeah. on up to Oklahoma City. Was, who, who made the trail? Who blazed the, it? Uh, the trail was named, and a, a big part of the, the work on that trail was done by Alex Singletary, who was at one time the national representative for the Chamber of Commerce from Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. And they were good friends, Singletary and my stepfather. In fact, the two of them surveyed a lot of the land on, uh, in uh, Kiowa County and, and those counties in there. And they did it by wagon wheel. They huh. tried to deal on the spoke of a wagon wheel or buggy wheel and every time that went over it was a rod or a certain length and they measured that all off hmm. and he my father stepfather had really a marvelous memory and he could correct abstracts in Cowell County and beat the records in the courthouse on it from, from memory he could yeah. tell you practically every quarter section of land in Cowell County who filed on it, who he sold it to, and who owned it at the time. All the transfers of those. What was his name? His Huckabee. Father. George Wilson Huckabee. And Alex Singletary wrote a story about him one time in the Daily Oklahoman. They called him the Sage of Cowell County. <laughs> when was the Ozark Trail founded? I can't remember exactly, but it was back in the, oh, in the, before the 20s, I'm mm -hmm. quite sure. And what was the Rainy Mountain Mission? Who it was an Indian mission uh, established to, for the explicit purpose of taking care of the Indians in that area. Who, who found a, that? I don't know. It was a religious deal yeah. in the first place. They had, Which? Uh, they, it was uh, some church organization, and they had a school there for the Indians. Yeah. And it was, hmm. they call it Rainy Mountain Mission because it was, the whole property was right at the foot of this Rainy Mountain. Yeah. <clears throat> That's in the old Washington Mountains. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. What kind of chores did you do in the farm as a child? What? what kind of chores? Did I do on the farm? Yeah. You name it and I did it. Milked the cows, slopped the pigs, fed the chickens, shocked the wheat, thrashed the wheat, pitched bundles, the whole works. You chopped cotton? Yes, sir. Picked it, too. How much could you pick in a day? Oh, I wasn't a very good cotton picker. <laughs> I finally got to where I could pick maybe a couple hundred pounds. Hmm. Where was the local gin? There was two of them in Hobart hmm. that I remember. I can't remember the names of the people that owned them, and I know them just as well as anything. It's been so long ago, I can't uh, help remember. So you say you shocked wheat? Oh, yeah. I, I how, do you shock, shock, how do you shock wheat? The binder comes through the field and cuts the wheat, and it automatically ties it in bundles. Then two of you come along behind the binder, and you pick the bundles up and stick them on the ground like that, with the points up like this. And so if it rains, the water hits it and runs off. It doesn't lay on the ground and absorb water. Now with the heads at the top? The heads at the top like okay. this, yeah. like a teepee. Right. And, and then you, when you thrash the wheat, you have a, a bundle wagon with a man on the wagon and two uh, on the ground. Or maybe no one, I think, maybe it was one. Yeah, it was one. And he'd pitch them up to you and you'd stack them on the wagon. And then you'd to go to the thrashing machine, you run up to this big, we worked with a 36 inch Romley, which was one of the biggest, or 56 inch Romley, which was one of the biggest thrashing machines in the country that time. And you have a, two spike pitchers, one on this side and one on this side. A spike pitcher? Spike pitcher. That's all he did was climb on that wagon and help you unload your wagon of wheat. One on each side of that elevator, okay. conveyor that took it into the thrashing machine. And the only way you could get a rest was to throw so much in it it choked the machine down, and then you could rest till it got it and choked. <laughs> we did that several times. And the food on the thrashing crew was, was out of this world, really. Who cooked for the crew? The farmer whose wheat you were thrashing. And you had a cook shack to go with you, and then you'd, you'd take that cook shack along, and then the woman that here that owned the farm, she had helped the woman in a cook shack. And I'm, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Ask a question. Uh, how many men in a thrashing crew? I don't remember exactly. You have uh, maybe five or six bundle wagons, and there would be a two for each bundle wagon. Mm -hmm. And then there would be the engineer. My cousin ran the, the uh, engine, steam engine. And uh, then his brother and I had a bundle wagon that we worked off of. Yeah. I'd pitch him up for a while, and he'd pitch him up, and I'd place him. And then we'd go into the deal, and uh, they'd have to unload it. One of us stayed in the field all the time to load the next wagon, and the other one took it in. How much does a shock weigh? A, a bundle of wheat? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Of course, it would vary. You, you put the same amount of wheat in every bundle, but if it was extra good wheat, the heads were full and firm, it would weigh more than the next one, which wasn't very. Mm -hmm. So I can't tell you exactly what a, shock, mm -hmm. a bundle of wheat would weigh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly how does did the thrasher work? You know, you, you said well, you had the 56-inch runway? Uh, yeah, 56-inch runway. I, I don't remember the, seemed like it was, well, it was 56 inches long and this wide. But anyway, that was the, the, the separator they called it, mm -hmm. was called a 56-inch Romney, and then the, th the, the uh, steam engine that powered it with a big belt. And you'd put your wheat in there, and it'd go through, and it'd shell all the wheat out of the heads, and it'd come out over here into a wagon, and the, th and the straw would go out over here into a stack out of a uh, pipe that you'd blow it out over. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And another I bailed a lot of alfalfa hay. That's another experience. <laughs> it's hard work, I'll tell you. Um, what did you do during World War I? Well, I was 13 years old. And I can't remember much about it except everybody had the flu. 
my whole family was down with it. It was after my father died and my mother had remarried, and there was eight of us in the family. And they all had the flu, everybody but me. And I had to take care of them. <laughs> had to take care of them? Oh, we had a good doctor that told us, told me what I had to do. And, you know, I, they were all bed fast, but I did the majority of the work around the house. What kind of medicine did you have? Huh? What kind of medicines did you have at that time to huh, treat the flu? Don't ask me. I don't know. <laughs> what did the doctor tell you to do for them? You're going back beyond my memories on that. I know I was the only one up and around you continually. Hey, you can tell them what, how they saved your life when you had pneumonia. Yeah. I, when I was four years old, I had typhoid fever, pneumonia, and hooping cough all at one time. And uh, there was a doctor there, uh, Dr. L.H. Huffman. And he said, this boy can't live. So call your folks in. And so he tried, and he did. He took a bed sheet and soaked it in water, spread it over the bed, and put a pan of ammonia in that bed sheet and opened my lungs up. Ammonia. See that scar back there? Yeah. One on each side, these swell like that. Those glands, and then you got the lancet to open them up. Hmm. I graduated from high school in 1924. There, they had built a new school building in the north end of town, right at the north end of Main yeah. Street. And I was the first class that graduated from that high school. Building. Everything going okay? Do you remember Armistice Day yeah, as as when the war ended? Oh yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, the big was there big yeah. celebrations in Hobart? Or? I don't remember really. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you. What was your first job after high school? My first job after high school, I went to Enid in '25. And my first job after high school was working at a, at a local gin. And this man, man had promised me a job clear through for a year so I could save some money and go to college. And he didn't, I, did, I couldn't deliver the goods or he didn't deliver, I don't, I thought I was doing a good job, but anyway, I lost a job. I didn't, I couldn't stay and I didn't earn enough money. So I went to Enid, my brother was up there. And uh, the first job I had in Enid was uh, frying hamburgers, nickel hamburgers. Yeah. <laughs> What'd you do in the gin? while you were there? Uh, it seemed like that my job was to see that the cotton seed was, when they ginned it, and the people come by to get, I, don't, I, I did had something to do with the cotton seed. I can't tell you exactly what it was. I, I don't remember. Anyway, I know that when they, uh, they unloaded the cotton, it goes, they sucked it out through a big tube and it went into the gin. It came back in the bin with the, the cotton seed. And if the farmer wanted it, they come by and got it. And I had to keep that cotton seed shoveled up to mm -hmm. where it was supposed to be. When was, when did you see your first combine? Oh, uh, when I was maybe 10 years old, eight, 10 years old. What'd you think of it? Oh, the, the combine? Yeah. Oh, I, I, was, I was thinking about a thrashing machine. Hmm. When did they bring the combine out? I don't remember. It must have been in the 20s sometime, as far as I remember. That's when it was, it was mm -hmm. in the 20s. I can't tell you exactly. One experience I had, though, was that uh, people in Oklahoma will remember is that uh, my uncle and his family, two boys, lived on a farm six miles east of Hobart at Comalty, in the country school there. Mm -hmm. They went to school in this country school and I was out there with them at Christmas time. And uh, we had planned to go to the Christmas social at Babs Switch south of Hobart. And we, well, we didn't go. And we stood out in that schoolyard that Christmas Eve night and watched that schoolhouse burn where all those people burned to death. Mm. 
and that's just how close I come to being there that night. It just it was wasn't too bad a weather, but it was cold, and we thought, well, we better stay at home and go to our own Christmas social. And we, we saw that fire down. We didn't know what it was at the time, but we saw it burning. I think there was 26 or 27 people died in that yeah. fire. What year was that? It was 20. Uh, 19. I can't remember the date. Yeah. And what was the name of the school? Bab Switch. Bab Switch. Right. I know one of the the teacher that was there was a, a sister to one of my schoolmates. I was in in high school, I guess, at the time. I think I was in high school, twenty. I know I was. And, yeah. and his her brother was one of my schoolmates. She mm -hmm. was younger than she was. Mm -hmm. How long did you stay in Enid? I was there from 1925 to 1935. What'd you do in Enid? <coughs> well, <coughs> besides cook hamburgers. <coughs> I said that was my first job. It yeah, wasn't. Right. My first job was with Studi Baker Motor Company in the parts department because my brother was working in the garage. Mm -hmm. He was a mechanic at that time. And I went to work for them. And they closed up, and I went to work for the Comeback Hamburger Stand Fine Hamburgers. And I went from there to the Holland Furnace Company and went to work for them installing furnaces. And I got on, I was out on the job one day, and his paint crew was working at the same time I was putting his furnace in. And this, this contractor talked me into going to work for him at $2 an hour, $2 a day. And I was making six to nine dollars a day installing furnaces, piecework. And I went to work for him at 25 cents an hour. And I've never regretted it. I got an education in, in decorating and painting and color harmony and all that kind of stuff. He was an expert. He'd graduated from the, the Chicago Art Institute. And he uh, actually was an uh, alcoholic. But he did take an interest in me and taught me yeah. a lot of things that I'd never learned anyplace else. So, what was your main job as a as a decorator? Well, a no, I was I wound up as a contractor. I, I never did any actual decorating as such, mm -hmm. but I did the decorating. I did the work for the decorators, right. which is decorating contractor, painting contractor. And I've done a lot of it. I came here in 1935. And well, I owned a cafe in Enid for a while before I came here, and I sold it and came up here where my brother was. And uh, then I sold that cafe and went to work for Stokes Bolton, the paint business, running in. I gradually, just gradually went from that into work for myself, yeah. contracting. Mm -hmm. how, how did the Depression affect you and your family? <laughs> I don't know, it was rough. I lived in Enid at the time and I was married. However, uh, it would have been a lot rougher, but my uh, wife's father was deputy court clerk up there. And uh, he owned a lot of property in the north end of Enid. And uh, just before the Depression hit, I had access to all this property. And I'd been in the paint business and I knew something about the construction business, home construction. And I started building houses and I built five before the depression hit. And then, bam, that was the end of it. <laughs> well, I've had a varied experience in many things. And what about World War II? I was in the contracting business at the time. Painting. I did uh, the uh, hospital, Borden General Hospital in Chickasha. I did a big housing project in Lawton. I did one in in uh, Muskogee. I did a bunch of houses in Chickasha. Did you any work for the government during the yeah, war? Yeah, yeah. That, that Borden Hospital was a government job. Mm -hmm. And I did the uh, bombing auxiliary base on the Salt Plains when it was built. What about WPA? 
I didn't have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. I had a friend that was with it. No, he was, uh, uh, take that back, he, uh, he was with the, that uh, CCC. Conservation yeah, CCC. Board. Yeah, he was with them. He was a young mm -hmm. fellow. He was a uh, meat cutter by trade, but he got tough and he had, so he went on uh, to this, mm -hmm. out in Colorado someplace. Mm -hmm. But I did have a, an uncle, this Bill McGuire at Hobart, who was a superintendent on WPA work at one time. Mm -hmm. He built quite a few things around yeah. I remember the, the green belts that they put in back in those days to, to uh, alleviate all that dust bowl stuff. I remember those. That's what about the dust storms around Hobart? I don't remember so much around Hobart. I lived in Enid when oh, it was really right. bad. How about Enid? You, you couldn't see past the west side of town sometimes. It was terrible. How long would the dust storm last? Oh, they'd blow in and maybe uh, last a day, two days, and they'd blow themselves out and they'd come back in. I, they weren't constant. They just, those mm -hmm. winds would start blowing and they might blow for a day, two days, or three days, and boy, the dust, was, of course it was dry and everything was just mm -hmm. turned mm -hmm. it loose. But I remember one time I went out and did some work on a, some kind of a WPA or some kind of work, and I got paid in turnips. Hmm. <laughs> a day's work, and I got a peck of turnips or something yeah. like that. Huh. I don't remember what it was exactly. Those were the days? Yep, that's right. But you, you learned in the Depression, how to survive, I'll tell you that. I sure did. How many kids do you have? I have none of my own. I had uh, two stepchildren by my first wife. And then uh, we divorced and she died and I married again and she died. We lived 24 years together. And then uh, I married uh, Sarah James, whose husband was Otis James, a judge here in Oklahoma City, mm -hmm. and she died. And then I met this sweet thing out here in suburbia, <laughs> and we got married in 79. What's your name? Madeline. Madeline. How long have you been married? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. My name was Madeline Jans, and changes to Gans. J A N Z. She has a son here who is uh, an electrical engineer with MPI. Yeah. They build computers. Mm -hmm. And they have five children. And one of them is 22 years old and then they're down to eight. It's a wonderful family. How big was Enid when you first moved to it in 25? I would say uh, 20,000. Mm -hmm. What did Main Street look like? Main Street and Enid? Yeah. Well, Main Street run along the south side of the square. And uh, Independence was on the run north and south. Grand uh, was uh, north and south. Broadway run east and west. And Maple, no, not Maple, it was hmm, Main, Broadway. Hmm, what is Maple? I can't remember the name of that street on the north side of the square. Anyway, Independence and Grand was on the east and west side. And then it's a post office at one end and a courthouse in the middle. County jail was in, in the courthouse. Hmm. When did they put that Air Force Base in Enid? Was that after it, the war? Well, no, it was during the war. It was. Yeah, they, they put that in there in 
And uh, it was in before I did the, the bombing base, uh, auxiliary base on the Salt Plains, because they used it for their bombing range from uh, Enid Air Force Base. Well, I owned a cafe in Enid too one time. What was the name of it? Claris Cafe. Claris Cafe. I sold it and moved to Oklahoma City. I think I said something about yeah. that before. How come I, you moved to Oklahoma City? What? How come you moved to Oklahoma City? Uh, I wanted to be with my brother. He uh, left there and came to Oklahoma City and went to work. He had worked at the News and Eagle, in the News and Eagle as pressman. And he came to Oklahoma City and went to work for the Oklahoma Publishing Company in the press room. And uh, I didn't want to be in Enid by myself. My grandmother and grandfather had lived there, and my uncle, and they had all moved out and left me there by myself. So I mm -hmm. came to Oklahoma City to be by myself, I mean with my brother. Yeah. And uh, this uncle that left... Uh, Painted. I don't remember exactly when it was, but he was one of the superintendents or farm superintendent for the Oklahoma, for the Baptist Orphans Home out here that they just yeah, sold and they right. rebuilt it. He was, he was farm superintendent on there. Hmm. Do you know anyone that survived the Babs Witch fire? Did I know anybody that did? That's still around? Well, I probably did, but I can't call their names. Yeah. You know, it's been so long ago. Mm -hmm. There were several in it that I that died in it that I knew. The one that I remember distinctly is a school teacher because of her relation to this friend of mine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What did you think about Korea? What did I think about it? Yeah. I thought that I wasn't there. I don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. You think but we should have gotten involved over there in Korea? Well, I don't know. The one that I that I really is, makes me angry with the government is the way they sloughed off and didn't win the war in Vietnam. They could have won it in 30 minutes, mm -hmm. 30 days. Mm -hmm. It wasn't taking 30 minutes to run up there and, and bomb Hanoi off the face of the earth and this would have been the war would have been over and they wouldn't have lost all that land down there. They're going to do the same thing in, in Central America if they're not careful. They're going to lose it in spite of anything. Well, I think they did the right thing in Korea. I think they went in and I think they should stay there and keep the Russians out. And it's I, I, I get so angry sometimes with with uh, some of the people in our government, the way they ride Reagan, and he has been really a, a good president, and he has tried to do the right thing. And he's bringing us out of the Depression, he brought us out of that inflationary period, and they just keep riding him and dogging him and, and downgrading him until it's pitiful. It's, it's not right, because he, is, he has done a good job and I, time, every time I think about Tip O'Neill, I think somebody ought to send a bulldog after him <laughs> and get him out of there. <laughs> well, I think we have a good interview. Do you mm -hmm. have any questions? Or no, I'm from Illinois. So I didn't know anything about Oklahoma. What part Sa of Illinois? West Salle, Illinois. She worked for West Fox. West Fox. Mm -hmm. How come you came to Oklahoma? Well, my husband passed away, and I was a widow for nine years. And uh, the yard work got to be too much. It was too hard to find the boys to take care of the lawn. They were going off to college, and you had to get a new one. And so I decided I was going to sell my house, and I was going to rent an apartment and call up my son, who was in Oklahoma City. And he and his wife said, no, no, you can't do that. If you sell your house, you have to come out here so you'll be close to us so we can look after you. So that's how I came to Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. I moved to suburbia and went to Illinois for a visit. When I came back, he had moved next door to me. 
<laughs> that did it. it was the girl next door. Yeah, the girl next door. <laughs> she <laughs> said no till I ignored it. <laughs> he warmed her down. <laughs> he really did. <laughs> well, thank you. Gonna. <clears throat> was it unusual for a woman to draw a claim in 1901? I don't know whether it was or not, but the reason she did, there was uh, the whole family had already reached the maturity age, and she was the only one that, that was single, except a younger sister who couldn't and a younger brother who was too young to follow the claim. They came with, with their father down here. Yeah. Their mother was the oldest one of the three, and she was old enough to follow the claim. But I don't know whether it was unusual or not. I couldn't tell you. Yeah. I know, uh, if she did, somebody else could do it. Right. Mm -hmm. It was pretty rough, I imagine, filing on a claim and approving it, getting it approved up. Yeah. You had to live on it. You had to build a house on it and live on it for a certain length of time. Now, who built the house on the mother's well, I guess uh, her brother and father, and then they hired some help to build it. She didn't build it, I know. It was just a little cabin there. It was torn down and before I ever become old enough to know what it was. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. There's a, a story that I forgot to tell you. Okay. You got that on? Yeah. Uh, the father owned a, a stock barn just uh, two blocks west of the square on Main Street. And uh, he had a bunch of mules in there, in this pen and a big picket fence around and a big board gate. And those mules panicked somewhere or other. And my brother was out in the yard. And they knocked that gate down. And he was right in the path of those mules when they come out of that gate. And you know, a horse wouldn't have done it, cattle wouldn't have done it. But they just separated like that. My brother was laid here. The horses were moving around and they missed it completely. They just flat opened up, you know, just like that and went around him. He didn't get a scratch. Boy. Was, and then he built another big barn out farther west in town after they closed that down. Hmm. It was quite a business in Howard at that time. Yeah. In the early day, it was it was the stock business, horses yeah. and mules. There was another big stock buyer there named Roll Logan, uh -huh. and they did a lot of business together. My father and Logan did. You say your father sold horses to the army? Yeah, he bought them for them. At bought Fort them and sold them at Fort Reno. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you.